So let's just sit up nice and tall and close the eyes. And take a few minutes just to feel centered. And feel your body supported by the chair that you're sitting in. And feel your posture supported by the skeleton. And feel that your bones are healthy and strong. And feel that the muscle and the skin, the fatty tissues that are hanging on the skeleton are all relaxed but strong. Feel that you are strong. And breathing in and breathing out, with each breath, allow yourself to become relaxed in your own strength. Relaxed in your own strength. And then keeping yourself in a relaxed state with the eyes closed or at a soft gaze, the posture tall and the breath flowing. Allow yourself to absorb the words of the Divine Mother. The following is from the Devi Gita, verses 7.11 through 7.27. Herein the Goddess explains at length Supreme devotion. Now be attentive while I explain the highest kind of devotion. One who constantly listens to my virtues and recites my names. Who is firmly intent on me, a treasury of auspicious qualities. Whose concentration is ever steady, like a continuous flow of oil who has no ulterior motive at all in these actions, having no desire for liberation in any form, whether living in my presence, sharing my power, merging into me, or dwelling in my heaven, who knows absolutely nothing better than serving me, cherishing the notion of servant and master, and thus not aspiring even for liberation who enthusiastically thinks of me alone with supreme affection, knowing me truly as never separate from oneself, not acknowledging any difference, who thinks of beings as embodiments of myself, loving other selves as one's own self, who makes no false distinctions, realizing the universality of pure consciousness, my omnipresent essence manifested in all beings everywhere, and at all times, who honors and respects even the lowest outcast, discarding any sense of difference and thus wishing harm to no one, who is eager to see my sacred sights and to see my devotees, whose heart is overwhelmed with love for me, whose body thrills with joy, whose eyes are filled with tears of love and whose voice falters, who, with such enraptured feelings, worships me as ruler, as womb of the world, and cause of all causes, who performs my splendorous rites, both the regular and the occasional, always with devotion and without miserly regard for cost, who longs to see my festivals and to participate in them, ever impelled by such desires arising spontaneously, O mountain, who sings on high my names while dancing, unself-conscious and forgetful of the body, who accepts the fruits of past karma as what must be, unconcerned with thoughts of preserving the body. Such a person practices devotion deemed supreme, in which there is no thought of anything except me, 
the mother, the person in whom such supreme devotion truly arises, then dissolves into my essential nature of pure consciousness. And taking a moment to breathe that in. And breathe out. And then fluttering the eyes open. So the Devi Gita is a scripture um, in the yoga tradition. Devi is the goddess or the mother, and Gita means song. And so all of the different names, um, many of them, have a Gita. They have a song that is uh, recited in their honor. And here, the Devi Gita is the, the song for the mother, the mother of the universe. And in here, as in all Gitas, so Krishna has a Gita, <clears throat> Shiva has a Gita, many of them have Gitas. And they all talk about what it is to be human, what it is to suffer, how to alleviate that suffering, and what it is to be self-realized, to be liberated. And they all talk about the stages and the steps, the ingredients in that experience, and the obstacles to it. And this very important ingredient in the experience of liberation is oneness. The goddess talks about this in these verses. So the one who goes beyond differences, the one who sees no more differences, the one who recognizes the goddess in everything, the one who recognizes only the presence of the goddess in all things everywhere, the presence of the Divine Mother. She doesn't look and say, Laura is full of the mother, but Tom and Joe, not so much. The devotee to the mother recognizes all things as the creation, all things, without exception. That doesn't mean that we don't see harmfulness versus harmlessness in actions. Of course we do. That's part of our job basically, as human beings, is to recognize that which causes harm from that which does not cause harm, and then to work in our own life to be as harmless as possible. But sometimes harm is necessary, because change can be, it can bring about a sense of harm, a sense of discomfort, a sense of temporary suffering. But there's a purpose to it. It's not done as an emotional knee-jerk reaction Anger, hatred, those types of things. We don't see people and discriminate because maybe their status in life is different from our own or their age is different or their experience is different. It's very big in the yoga world right now. It's very interesting to see that there are teachers who look out and say, well, if you practice yoga in a gym, you're not really practicing yoga. It's like, no, all yoga is the mother. So it doesn't matter if you're practicing yoga in the gym in your car, on an airplane, or in an ashram. If you're practicing yoga, you're practicing yoga. Mm -hmm. Period. Some people look out into the world today and they say, well, you know, um, one flower is a prize winner and one flower is a weed. And the reality is, no, both flowers are of the mother. Therefore, both flowers are absolutely beautiful. Some people look out and say, well, one person is worthy of receiving support from others and one person is unworthy because they've had harmful behavior in the past. And that's not accurate. Both individuals are worthy of support from their community because that's the only way that they're going to realize the existence of compassion within themselves, the existence of the mother within themselves. There's a village, and when someone in the village does something that is... um, harmful to another member of that that unit of that that tribe they don't start insulting them and putting them in jail they put them in the middle of a circle kind of like this one and everybody starts shouting compliments at them don't you remember when you did this great thing don't you remember that you are the child of the great one don't you remember that you're a member of this community do you know how wonderful you were when this happened? And their, their mentality, their psychology is that you get more with honey. You get more by acknowledging the goodness. You will get less by seeing only the harmful. And this begins with us. When we look in the mirror, what do we see? 
we look in the mirror and we say, well, everything in life is wonderful, peachy keen, but you, well, you kind of suck. <laughs> we do, right? Now, that tends to be very critically, harmfully judgmental to the self. And in those moments, we are forgetting the mother. We're forgetting that she resides within us. And that our life is an experience of her consciousness. And that our life is played out within her consciousness. And as we talked about last week, the universe is her body. And our life, our actions are played out upon that. If we understood that, really, you know, if we really accepted that as part of our reality, we would never look in the mirror and say anything other than, you know, I love you. I have difficulty with you sometimes. <laughs> but I love you. <laughs> you know, I do have difficulty with you. I acknowledge that because it's not about stuffing emotions and feelings. It's about bringing them to a place where they can be seen honestly, held compassionately, and adapted, adjusted, and accommodated as necessary in order to bring about a greater sense of freedom and wellness in our human experience. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this idea of oneness, this concept, this, this thing that seems so far away from us, we say, in the yoga world you hear a lot, oh, you know, well, we're all one then why are you competitive with the yoga studio down the street if we're all one? If you really adhere to that, why are you bad-mouthing them? Oh, well, we're all one, so be harmonious. And then you go home and kick the dog. You get angry with someone who took a parking spot you felt belonged to you. You know, people are in your way and you want them to move because you're just in a rush to get to the red light. When we stop to think about oneness in terms of the Devi Gita or the Bhagavad Gita or the Shiva Gita or any of, of the scriptures that are associated with yoga or any thoughts that are associated with mindfulness, what we're saying is, I deserve no more or less than you because I am no more or less than you because we're both human and we both are here to do our healing work. So instead of looking at someone else as a threat or a competition or as a comparison to justify our own poor behavior or the greatness of our behavior, <laughs> we begin to look and say, I recognize that suffering because I too am there. Now how can I walk through this world more compassionately with more mindfulness so that I don't contribute to that suffering? Some students say, well, that's an awful lot of work. And I don't know if I want to invest that deeply. And really, the only answer to that is, well, then, if you don't wish to invest that deeply in healing, then you must wish to invest deeply in suffering. Because it's one or the other. When it comes to those two, there's really not a neutral territory. Not really. You're either invested in your wholeness or you're invested in a sense of fragmentation. And when we look out at others with, with judgmentalism about value and worth, that's fragmented. But when we look at others and we work to see, you know, that people make poor decisions because they're suffering, not because they're happy, not because they know their wholeness. People who know their wholeness don't make decisions that harm other people because they know that their wholeness is dependent upon and interrelated with everyone else's wholeness. This is why the Buddha said, yes, any person alive can climb to the top of the mountain of enlightenment. They can. Right now, you can become instantaneously enlightened. But you can't stay there. You can't stay there segregated from the rest of your body. And the rest of your body is every single being that exists in this world, in this universe. You have to come back from that place and work to liberate all beings everywhere. Some students might say, but that's a big job to work to liberate. I can't liberate myself. How am I going to liberate everybody else? By not being harmful to them. 
You're not liberating them from their problems. That's their work. They have to come to adjust their life story, their life path. You can certainly support that. But the first thing that you're doing is not holding them hostage to your expectations, to your perspectives and opinions. You're allowing them to exist freely of you. And that's a great gift to give people. You're not removed from the situation. But you are not imposing either. Does that make sense? Yeah. How do we do that? Yeah, that's (laughs) the next question. (laughs) It's very hard. It is very hard. How do we do that? You know, there's a lot of ways. This, This yoga is thousands of years old. And they recognized thousands of years ago all of the trials and tribulations that humans go through. And they came up with processes for different types of personalities. They said, well, the individual who has a tamasic mind, a tamasic mind is a mind that is downtrodden, is a mind that is, um, sees the negative a lot, is a mind that is stuck, in habitual patterns of thinking that are harmful to itself and to others. Um, Some things that tend to be associated with tamas um, are obsession, um, obsessive compulsiveness, uh, some forms of depression, some forms of anxiety, uh, some forms of prejudice, judgmentalism. Then we have rajas, And rajas is associated with activity. So overthinking. Type A personality. (laughs) Yeah. Hey, I got that one down. Yeah. Type A personality, you know. A, A rajasic mind is always thinking. And they're always judging. They're passing judgment, 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 judgment. Not because they're trying to like to hate on people or things, but because they're looking for the solution. Because your rajasic mind is always looking for the solution. Your tamasic mind is always looking to avoid. Your rajasic mind is always looking to get involved and take over, thereby stealing the opportunity of others to be involved. Yeah. And then you have the sattvic mind. And the sattvic mind is the harmony. Generally speaking, it's harmony. It's the harmony and the balance in the mind. But too much sattvic can bring it to a place of rajasic in fundamentalism. So we begin to fundamentally think, well, you know, my way of purity is better than yours. And then we start separating again. They are called gunas, by the way, maha gunas, the great qualities of nature. Rajas, tamas, and sattva. And if you look outside right now, there's a lot of tamas happening. Yes. Right? The trees don't have leaves. They're not in a growing phase. The, the earth is heavy with snow, at least right here. Um, it's, it's a hibernating time of year. It's very tamasic. It's very, very slow, kind of dull. You know. Spring is rajasic. Lots of growth, lots of green, lots of things happening. Lots of energy. The snow is gone, or we want it to be. Yeah. We feel something on the inside of us, a little impulse to start jogging or going to the gym or just climbing a tree or doing something <laughs> that's amazing and, 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 and meaningful. And there's a, there's, a place, there's a place when springtime is in full bloom, when the flowers are just coming out. And there's an essence to that. There's an essence of rejuvenation and balance. And that's sattva. In the midst of winter, there's a time when it just feels right and healthy to just be in that place of quiet. That's sattva. So we have these three mahaguna, and they are the qualities of the goddess. They belong to her. They are her. So, so whether we are saying that we're stuck in a habitual pattern of behavior that's harmful to ourselves, or we're actively seeking to balance ourselves, It all comes from nature. All of it. Therefore, it's all her. 
even the part of it that is uncomfortable and uh, sometimes disappointing to the ego. They often call her Maya. Maya means illusion. She's not only the illusion, she's also the solution. She's both. Just like you're both, not both. We are both our problem and our solution. So we really are. We're our our own worst enemy. Yeah. So there's a lot of self-responsibility in these writings. There's a lot of self-study. We were saying, you know, the Buddha said, you can go to the top of the mountain, but you have to come back because you're still in a human form. So you need to be in the world, working in the world to alleviate suffering. First way to alleviate suffering is mind your own business, egotistically. Mind your own business. Don't keep telling people what's wrong with them. You know, don't keep holding people hostage to your expectations. Recognize that they're on a spiritual path. That they're seeking something too. And just like you're suffering, so are they, even if you're not recognizing it. Some people seem happy beyond compare. There's still some place where they're suffering. There has to be. They're human. They're not happy, happy, joy, joy, 24 hours a day. Life doesn't work that way. But the beautiful thing is that the more that you dive into the teachings, the more you recognize that there's beauty in both the creation and the destruction. There's beauty in all of it. Because all of it is meant to be the basis of a divine experience of your own awakening. What does that mean? What happens when I'm awake? What happens when I see that oneness, really? Like, what is that real oneness? What happens to me? Well, for at least moments in time, the imbalanced part of the ego is no longer present. It's no longer telling you to doubt yourself, to hate yourself, to hurt yourself, to doubt, hate, or hurt others. At least for moments at a time, that part of the ego is evolved to balance, to harmony. And then you just walk peacefully and compassionately through the world and through this life. And someone says, but don't, don't you get mad? And you're like, of course I get mad. But I realize I don't have to act on it. I don't need to be the judge, the jury, and the punisher. I don't need to be any of them. I can just look and recognize Suffering, 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 suffering. Across the board, <laughs> suffer. Healing, 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 healing across the board also. Because suffering doesn't want to stay suffering. You know, it doesn't. Everything is an energy of the goddess. Everything. This is the oneness that she's talking about in these passages. To contemplate divine, supreme devotion is to contemplate the oneness of all things everywhere. Even the energies that flow, the energy of anger, the energy of sadness, the energy of joy, these are all like little people, and they're all looking for a path. So we have these vines out here in the yard. They're very interesting. Somebody told me this once, and I didn't believe it until I saw it. I was like, that's got you. That's weird. But if you sit still by one of these vines long enough, just an hour or two, it'll touch you. It'll go, are are you strong enough for me to wrap myself around? And then you get a little freaked out, and you're like, whoa, wait, that's a vine. (laughs) And that vine, that one vine has many tentacles, and every tentacle will touch something separately. Because each tentacle is looking for its truth, its place to be. Your emotions are your tentacles. Your anger is reaching out in one direction. Your sadness is reaching out in another. Your joy is reaching out in another. And they're looking for something sturdy enough to wrap themselves around. And they're not finding it. Because there's really only one thing that's strong enough to hold them and to allow them to evolve into their elevated state of being. And that's oneness. Love, compassion, 
the word you want to put to that. But it must include oneness. Otherwise, we're still fragmented. So, so the emotions, Wayne Dyer, who is oh, just an amazing speaker who's passed on now, but um, you know, he has this great book called There's a Spiritual Solution to Everything. And in there, he talks about how energy really only moves in two ways. It moves toward its source or it moves away from its source. But it wants to move toward its source, just like you and I do. But then we, we get in there, and we're like, and these are my words now, not, not his. I just, you know, I listened to that, and I was so inspired by his words, and I sat down with that for a real long time, and I thought about it. Well, then what is my relationship to my feelings? If, if feelings that I say belong to me are moving in one of two directions, how am I influencing that? And I thought, well, because I'm holding them hostage. I'm holding a grudge. I'm holding on to anger. I'm holding on to fear. I'm holding on to disappointment. I'm holding on, holding on, and holding on. And I'm saying you cannot change because I don't know what life will be like if you're different. If you're not the anger that I recognize now, I, I don't know what you'll be, and I'm afraid of that. So I'm literally stopping that anger from evolving. I'm stopping it from changing course. I'm stopping it from, from transitioning into its opposite. We don't want to get rid of emotions. We can't. It's really not possible. It's very childish to suggest we can do that. You know, That's basically a psychological issue called stuffing it. <laughs> it's true. But what we can do is look at our emotions like children. Look at them like children who are lost. They've lost their way. And maybe I am angry for a really good reason. Maybe I am. Maybe I was harmed in some way. And I have a difficult time trusting. I don't need, I don't need to hold on to the mistrust. What I need to do is to learn how to recognize what is trustable. That's what I need to do. If I just hold on to, to, to distrust and I keep that, it's going to become a blockage in my body, in my mind. And I'm going to look at everybody that I come in contact with, and I'm going to say, distrust, 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 whether I know I'm doing it or not. And then that distrust can't evolve into its opposite, which is trust, because I'm not allowing it to. It doesn't mean that we should ever be a doormat for anybody. What it means is that we should be engaged, or we could be actively engaged in the practice of svadhyaya, which is self-study, and recognizing. You know, when I'm in this situation, my tendency is to be distrusting. And then be curious about what would happen if I changed my tendency and try it on for size even if it feels like you're faking it. You just try it on for size. Well, what would happen if I walked into this party, this crowded room of people where I usually want to sit in a corner somewhere and not talk to anybody, and just went and talked to somebody? Hey, how are you today? You know? I hope you're having a splendid day. What if I just said one nice thing to each person I encountered? How would that change the dynamic? Mm -hmm. Then the imbalanced ego comes and says, no, 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 no. Not as dramatic as the other way. Not so much there for me to do. You know, no story to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So be afraid. Be very afraid. Be very afraid. And then we'll do one of two things. We'll either remain very afraid, distrusting, or we'll take a chance. And we'll will create a neural pathway. A neural pathway in the mind and the brain. You know, that physiological pathway that allows us to expand our interaction capacity in the world. And maybe we'll walk through the room and we'll be like, hi, how are you? I hope everything's well today. You look very nice today. This today, that today, this today, that today. Get to the other side and be like, Oh. <laughs> but the thing is, you're standing there. And nobody's beating you. 
And maybe even if you were to turn around bravely and look at what you left behind you, you would see flowers blooming Mm -hmm. instead of the rampage of a storm. And that will allow you to realize the storm is only inside. You know, it's only inside. And you can plant seeds too. And maybe one of those people even come back to you and say, you know, that changed my whole life. I didn't even want to come here tonight. (laughs) And you're thinking to yourself, really? I'm not the only one? (laughs) You know, and then you can be grateful that you have the ability to lessen another human being's suffering in addition to your own. Yeah. And it's all right, right here, where she says, Knowing me truly as never separate from oneself, not acknowledging any difference, who thinks of beings as embodiments of myself, loving others as one's own self, who makes no false distinctions, realizing the universality of pure consciousness, my omnipresent essence manifested in all beings everywhere at all times. And that includes you, yourself. It's not an easy path. It's not seeing through rose-colored glasses either. There's some pretty harmful things going on in this world, and we need to know that. But knowing that, and then as a result of knowing that, forgetting that beauty exists, forgetting that unity exists, forgetting that she or he exists, or it or that, that just contributes to the suffering. Because why would you come up with a solution? There's no reason to. If everything is really that horrible, and if we are really that long gone, why would we work to a solution? That's why people aren't working to solutions. Because they're so lost, they have forgotten. They really have forgotten the, just the amazing unity that exists. It's not a pipe dream. It's true. You know, the trees, if they die, we die. Period. If the honeybee dies out, Mm -hmm. it's highly likely that we will too in large numbers. There's no comeback from that. Can't argue it. I mean, I guess you could, but it would would be a false argument. You suffer and I see you suffering. I am suffering too. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, as a human being, the tendency will be to see another person suffering and instead of acknowledge the, su- the suffering that's shared, put up a wall of fear. A wall of fear. $17 billion wall. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Instead of saying, how do we work together? Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous to look into another part of the world and say, well, you're not one of us. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So it so... We are all united everywhere. And until we can look at South America, Central America, Europe, Africa, Asia, North America, and every island everywhere, and every continent, whatever name you want to call them, as people, beings, part of our greater ecosystem, part of our greater spirituality, inherently so, then there'll always be a blockage in one of our our arteries. Always. There will always be a blockage until we can see all beings as one. Now, sometimes people say, yeah, but they don't see us that way. Well, that's because they were just as miseducated as we are. And maybe, maybe they'll change and maybe they won't. But that's not what matters. It has to start with us first, with you first, you yourself first. There's a beautiful quote in the Bhagavad Gita. Krishna is talking to Arjuna, and he says, It's better that you do your own work and fail miserably than to do the work of another. It has far more value. 
You can't do another person's work for them. Well, well, maybe if those people over there change, then we'll be able to change. But until then, we need to have violence. We need to have bombs. We need to have this and that. Well, the reality is, that's not the mentality that's going to change the world. It's just not. It hasn't worked yet. And I'm not saying we shouldn't defend ourselves. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, we should not propagate separation. Where separation does not really exist, except for in the ego that's not balanced so oneness how do we come to practice more oneness through kindness through committing more kindness kindness is not being a doormat that's not kindness kindness is consciously withholding judgment service local soup kitchen, your local school, your local, your local community of children who, I don't know, maybe, maybe holding a storytelling hour so that there's something positive that they can engage in instead of violent video games. So it's not enough to say, well, violent video games are all the issue. Well, of course they're part of the issue. What's the solution? Don't tell me the issue. I already know what the issue is. What's the solution? Pay up some solutions. Invest in the solution. And the solution is what brings us to greater oneness. So gather up all those little kids around your neighborhood and say, gather up all the parents too and say, let's have a positive storytelling circle. We used to do something like that when I was little. That wasn't that long ago. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Get all the parents together in your, in your, in your neighborhood and, and talk to them and say, you know, let's start to wean our children off of the violence. How about we work together as a community? And Joe Smith over there who lives at, you know, 111 Main Street says, I, I, I don't see the point. They're going to get it everywhere else. Well, fine. Are you willing to participate anyway? No. Okay, well, we're here if you change your mind. Not, well, you know, then you're a lousy parent. Mm -hmm. No. Okay, we're here when you are willing to participate. And then you go to the strength of the community who are like-minded, and you build from there. So we walk through this life, and we see the fear when we're looking in neighborhoods that we don't understand, looking at people that we don't understand, looking at ourselves and we don't understand, you know, and all those misunderstandings, they take us away from the experience of oneness. And so we walk a path in yoga to reconnect, to realize or re-realize that unity on whatever level we're able to. And it doesn't happen at a pace that we want it to, like I want it now, you know. It doesn't happen that way. So is there anything that you would like to say or anything you'd like to ask or what do you think? You were saying about the different personalities. Is there any way to necessarily change those personalities besides just accepting the oneness? (laughs) Yeah, um, through the practices. So what will happen, so you were in class this morning and um, this particular type of practice, I teach both active and passive practices. Um, the passive practice over time alters the personality by, by teaching patience and by allowing there to be enough stillness for the practitioner to see that there might be something they're missing in their assessment of themselves. That there's not just pain in the body, that there's also peace. And initially that's kind of a, it's an esoteric thought that, that isn't spelled out as straightforward as what I just said. Um, but it is definitely there. The active practices harness energy that is volatile sometimes, um, 
unclear and unfocused. And it focuses it. And it gives purpose to that random energy. So the more active classes, they can help to alter personality because they teach clarity on a different level. Both practices do. They teach clarity. They teach strength. They teach confidence. They teach willpower. They teach vision. They teach accuracy. Both of them do, but on different levels. And every time that we allow ourselves to be open to learning about such things, our personality is altered. But it's not altered overnight. It'll be little things. One day you'll just walk, wake up and be like, I just feel more patient today. It's really weird. Okay, next. Yeah. Or one day you'll wake up and, and you know, or maybe you're walking down the street and, and, and you notice that the tension has gone from the shoulder. Or that you don't mind being you today. That's a big one. And then a few minutes later, the ego changes and something else comes in and suddenly you do mind being you today. <laughs> but for a few moments, you didn't mind being you at all. And maybe you actually felt a little compassion for yourself, a little inspiration. You know? And then, then that's something to build on. So a habit happens this way. You repeat what you're doing. And the more that you repeat the thing, the more ingrained it becomes. So if I stop and have a chocolate bar every Sunday at 7 a.m., odds are I'm going to continue. So the first time put it in play, the second time built upon the first, the third time built upon the first and second, and so forth and so on. And unless I break that cycle somehow by grabbing, say, orange juice instead, then if I continue down that path, that's going to become an embedded habit of mine, a behavioral pattern that's going to feed my personality because maybe my personality is judging me, saying, you shouldn't have chocolate at 7 a.m. in the morning. Oh my gosh, that's just such a... You know? There's no law written that says you can't have chocolate at 7 a.m. in the morning, by the way. Right? Well, you should really be better to yourself. You should take better care of yourself. And so this whole stream of thoughts will happen, and every single one of those thoughts impacts the personality. So then you say, well, okay, I recognize that maybe 7 a.m. chocolate is not a great idea, so I'm going to try something else out for a change. And for 27 days, I'm going to take uh, natural orange juice, just a little cupful. 27 days. If you do it once and then go back to the chocolate, you haven't changed anything. <laughs> if you do it 10 times and then go back to the chocolate, you haven't changed anything. If you do it 27 times, the odds are less that you will go back to the chocolate. They're not eliminated, but they're far less. And they say that after 27 times, after 27 days every day of doing this, it becomes a new habit in and of itself. But then something crazy happens in the mind. And now, on the 28th day, you have both orange juice and chocolate bar. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, is it not? Yeah. And then the mind justifies it and it says, well, I'm having the orange juice. You know. Yeah. And it's been 27 days. Yeah. I don't know if it's 27 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, need, I should reward myself. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. As yeah. if. As if the process of cleansing the body wasn't reward enough. I have to, I have to reward my ego. Yeah. The problem is the only reward that the ego will accept is the one that feeds it. Mm -hmm. So in those 27 days, we have to also be doing other work. Looking at why we see things the way we see things. Why do we want the chocolate? That's the question. Yeah. That's the question. Why do we want the chocolate? Am I hungry? Am I angry? Am I lonely? Am I tired? Mm -hmm. Why do I want the chocolate? Maybe I could address why instead of taking the chocolate. And then the ego will say, well, just address why you take the chocolate anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without luck. <laughs> yeah, totally. 
And then, then, then it, you know, and it gets complicated and it gets challenging. And so it's no more challenging and no less challenging than climbing a mountain, taking a roller coaster ride. You know. it's, it's a journey that's worth it. It's worth taking. Yeah. It's amazing when the first time that you realize that it happens. Then you go, wow, <laughs> I did it. I, I was so mindful. Like the mindfulness, um, you know, you'll catch it after, just after. Yeah. And then yeah. it'll be a little bit closer to just after. And then it'll be when it's happening. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then that's the point where you go, oh, crap, I'm really doing this. I really, have, you know, I, I finally understand it and I'd be able to put that practice in practice so to speak. Yeah. Because I've been practicing it every day and being mindful and, and asking, why do I feel that way? Mm-hmm. And it's so it's been so enlightening to yeah. the answers to why. Yeah. It really is amazing. Yeah. It's very powerful. You know, it really is. But then at some point on this journey, um and through this study of yoga, initially we're a little infatuated with these changes. They're really very cool, uh, very interesting and curious, they're curiosities. But then the bhakti comes, and bhakti is devotion. It's love. And we go from being, and we can't skip the process though, you can't skip over. Not usually, it doesn't work that way. But we go from being critically watching everything to just loving, just being in love. For me, I don't have, you know, when I look at the, at the, at the essence of divine consciousness, I, I first see it as a formless energy that inhabits everything. And then I secondarily see it as this form, the mother. Um, and I just say to myself, if everything that I do, I do out of love, then nothing that I do will be harmful. I'm not perfect at it, mm-hmm. but that's in the mind. That's the thought that I br- try to bring to, to almost everything I do. If I'm doing this out of love, then it won't be harmful for anyone. But if I'm doing this out of ego, it'll be harmful on some level to someone. So but I can't help what other people feel. I can only help my own intention. That's all. I can only help my own intention. I can only do my work, whether I pass or fail. I cannot do the work for another. You know? Yeah. Anything else you'd like to say? Yeah? Yeah? So, let's sit up nice and tall and close the eyes. And I'll just read those few verses one more time. Knowing me truly as never separate from oneself, not acknowledging any difference, who thinks of beings as embodiments of myself, loving other selves as one's own self, who makes no false distinctions realizing the universality of pure consciousness. My omnipresent essence manifested in all beings everywhere at all times. To practice this is to practice supreme devotion, to be in the oneness, to walk peacefully and compassionately through this world and through this life. Drawing the hands together in front of the heart. Together we'll chant one beautiful Om. Take a nice breath in. Om. Loka samasta suki no bhavantu. May all beings everywhere find peace, love, light, and happiness. And may all beings know their oneness. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti.